We're going to begin. You got it? Okay, I'm going to call the uh, select board meeting, a special select board meeting of Tuesday, November 12th to order. And the first item is approval of the agenda. So, okay. If you have a uh, conversation, could you take it outside, please? I'll second. Moved and seconded. Are there any uh, recommendations to uh, changes to the agenda? Okay. All in favor of approving the agenda as drafted, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay. Next is approval of the minutes of the October 8th, 2019 select board meeting. Move that be approved. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, are there any uh, recommended changes to the, to the minutes? As they were drafted. Okay, hearing none, all in favor of approving the minutes as drafted, signify by saying aye. 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 And no opposed, and you have a, uh, I wasn't there, so an abstention. Uh, citizen comments, is there anybody here for something that is not on the, uh, the published agenda? Uh, please come forward and, and uh, Go ahead and take a seat. Hi, Les. My name's Les Fauché. I own a piece of property here for about two decades on Court Street. And I have a problem with flooding in my basement. I've talked to the town manager about it. She's talked to the road department. The flooding continues. My house has been rendered unsellable and unrentable. I have continuing damage and I need to have some action. I've prepared a couple photographs and I have a whole bunch more photographs that I'm willing to pass around for you to take a look at it. I'm going to give you these, Brian, so you can take a look at it. You look at them going. That's in front of the house. That's the sidewalk that floods. Sidewalk runs over and into my yard. That's a town truck. You see how deep the water is running into my yard. The town's remedy, remedy was to put a couple sandbags in front of the house. That was temporary action. Something needs to be done more permanent than that because the snow flow comes down and knocks the sandbags off. And in the summer, there's no sandbags there. And here's stuff floating around the basement. You can see the water pouring through the basement wall here, it sits upside down. And streams of water, whenever a truck goes by like that, the water rushes, fills the yard, and it comes through the basement wall. Part of the problem, here's another picture of the flooding. Part of the problem is the street drains being ill-maintained or being inadequate size. You can also see that there's a new a level of macadam. This problem did not exist when we first bought the house. I rented it to college students. I didn't have a problem, despite the fact that college students are nowhere near as attentive to it as a homeowner would be. Um, I believe the, the problem probably occurred when it was repaved, lifting the level of Court Street above the sidewalk and basically creating a drain in my basement for Court Street. I'd like to see the town take some action on this. I do not wish to involve a lawyer because it's going to cost all of us. But my town, my uh, my town taxes have been paid for 20 years. I've suffered the loss of a furnace. I've got a pile of sump pumps that would fill two wheelbarrows. I've got a hot water heater that's damaged in a front wall. The the old limestone concrete mix has been knocked out of the front wall by the water rushing through it. I also have witnesses from the town itself who were in my basement when that truck was parked there and who probably agree that there's a problem, otherwise they wouldn't have tried to abate it with the sandbags. If I try to fix this myself, I'm encroaching on the towns right away and I could become legally embroiled if I build something there that a 
child hits with a bicycle or a pedestrian hits walking. So I would rather not be responsible for that, but allow the town to build something that's engineered and adequate for that. And that would stop the water coming into my yard and into my house. I'd also like to note that some of the water that's running off is starting to undermine the bridge that's there and it probably should be looked at because that could be a severe thing. We're starting to get a little bit of a gully and the water is running running there and undermining the, the side of the bridge. I've got more supporting photographs that I'd love you to take a look at. Okay, so um, I think this is something we're not prepared to, you know, it's new, and we're not prepared to, to give you a response right now, Les. Um, we have a infrastructure committee that would, would uh, undertake that and, and work with uh, uh, the, uh, with Bill and, and Dan and, and look at that and also look at what the liability is. And, and uh, so, uh, when? Thursday. Thursday? I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know what you, um, I don't know that there's time to warn it yeah, for Thursday. Um, I, I think uh, we'll just leave it that we'll get back to you soon. It, it, it Should I, would you like me to leave these pictures? Um, I, I think if you could leave a couple for, for so Heather is the chair of that committee. Okay. And if she could oh, have these a couple. Are, these are very good. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Can we can we hang on to the larger mm -hmm. copy for now, and we could return them to you? Um, okay. Um, so what I'll what I'll try to do is um, talk with Kathleen about um, scheduling something, and ask her to get back to you when the infrastructure committee is going to convene, and we'll, so that you can come and participate if you can. Yeah. Um, and if you can't be there, at least um, maybe provide something written for the committee to review. Or, okay. Thank you. Okay. What's your address on Court Street? Pardon? What's your address? 83 Court Street. 83 Court Street. Right where the stoplight is and you turn up to the high school. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. And some of the pedestrians have also had problems <coughs> in the area because of the puddle. And it, it, it becomes a layer of mud on the sidewalk for kids to have to go through. And it's just, it's a nuisance. It's, and a liability for the city as well as destructive to my house. Is 83 the one that's on the opposite side from the high school? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, my wife and I walk through there a lot, and I've noticed that. This is the swamp. Oh. Yes. His, his yeah. property is right here. Yes. And this is the drive for the yeah. high school. After yeah. he mentioned, I know exactly this where is it is. The, this is the mm -hmm. cross where the, stu where the students cross. Yeah, it, it, it's, <clears throat> it's a mud pit. It's dangerous I do, I do know we it's, had, it's not safe. Yeah. We had some issues with the, with the stormwater structures mm -hmm. at that intersection that on the opposite side. Oh, on the opposite side. Okay. So we'll get back to you with a formal reply, but uh, as part of the process, it will be reviewed by, by the town staff and, and the infrastructure committee. Sorry. And so we'll let you know when, when it's going to be talked about at the infrastructure committee if you'd like to attend so that, uh, you know, if there's questions or points that you're disagreement with or anything like that, you could participate. Okay. Right. Thanks, Thank Les. <coughs> I didn't see his chief Hanley here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, there you are, Chief. <coughs> Hello. Hello. Evening, Chief. All right. Uh, this was uh, regarding a purchase order for. Uh, newer tasers than we use now, the electronic control device that we use. Uh, the normal plan was getting a little expensive for us. We did some research on it to see if we could reduce our costs for these maintaining these devices. And uh, we've done that, and we've got an agreement with them. Uh, you usually go on a five-year lease plan with these devices rather than outright purchases. So what we want to do is substitute the current lease plan for an updated lease plan with updated uh, units are a little more effective, a little more uh, documentation on them than we've had in the past. And the result is uh, reduce our costs for the first year and actually 
um, over a five-year period, it's like $107 a year for newer devices, which are scheduled to be replaced anyway over the next few years. Questions of Chief? No, the information is straightforward. Yep. Yeah. So. so. I'll make a motion to approve the purchase of 12 taser units and <clears throat> support <clears throat> packet, bracket, is it supposed to be packet? Packet. Yeah. packet. Yeah. Support packet under the sole source purchase provision in the purchasing policy, policy for a total cost of $4,884. Second. We've been seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That was easy, Chief. Thanks. I'm not Thank done you. yet. <laughs> I know. We'll see you in a bit. Okay. Um, so the next one, uh, and this is uh, something we had scheduled previously, but I had to, I had to leave uh, unexpectedly and wanted to participate. So asked if we could push it to, to this evening, which was discussion of uh, the Creek Road Task Force uh, recommendation to install guardrails on the south section. And uh, Heather chairs that uh, task force, and, and I'll pass it over to you to, to present on that. Okay. Um, so just quickly an update from the Creek Road Task Force, if I could indulge you guys for a few minutes. Um, we met last last Friday. Um, we're scheduled to meet again uh, this Friday morning. Um, unfortunately, my um, hope that we would have something to the select board in the form of a recommendation by the end of December is looking slim. Um, so I just wanted you to be aware of that. We are working. We, we do have a, a list of um, alternatives we're reviewing and I think we're making good progress and it's been a good committee and we're having good discussion um, but I think it's going to take us a little longer so I don't know that we'll have anything for town meeting this year related to Creek Road because of that so just wanted to give you that update so at a <clears throat> task force committee meeting um, motion was made to um, install guardrail in the southern section so that that road, section of the road could be opened up. Um, we talked about it in infrastructure committee. Um, we had a lot of good conversation, a lot of the same conversations that we've been having in the Creek Road Task Force we had in the infrastructure committee meeting, a lot of the same questions. Um, so it's pretty clear that, you know, the task force is still has work to do. Um, Ultimately, the, the infrastructure committee did not make a recommendation one way or another to support the motion or not, as you've seen. So, um, so that's, that's it in a nutshell. Okay. All right, uh, thoughts from the board, questions? So, um, you know, we're, this is kind of a critical next step for us to make a decision. And the direction to go. You know, we have a, an engineering study that's been done. We know it's an expensive thing to do a complete rebuild. So, it's obviously, we're looking for what are the alternates. So, um, and that is the, the, the task that I believe we all, the charge we gave. Um, is there any confusion about that on the committee? Is, does everybody seem to fully understand that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There, yeah, there is confusion, or not everybody understands. Uh, no, I, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> everybody <laughs> understands what our task is. Okay. okay. And we hope um, one of our goals for this Friday's meeting is to, um, for those members that are um, confident or, or feel comfortable, to submit what they would choose for a first, second, and third alternate. Okay. So that we can see where we might have commonality. Mm -hmm. Maybe we all don't agree on a first choice, but maybe there's more agreement on a second than we think, and that might help uh, move us um, more quickly in a, in a direction. Okay. So that is one goal for Friday's meeting. This good, Friday. Good. So how many options do you have emerged so far, approximately? Well, we've been in a really rough draft stage. Okay. Um, we have Peter's. Er you know, original three that mm -hmm. he presented, mm -hmm. and then we expanded on a few of them um, because some of the details, as you can remember in our discussion about whether 
what happens with particular sections of the road what were not addressed in those three options. Mm -hmm. So that's an expansion. Correct. We also tried to include um, the full range. So like if you consider fixing the road all at once at this end of the spectrum, we also tried to include um, what we consider the furthest end of the spectrum, which would be to throw up the entire road mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and maybe no no oh, compensation to, uh, yeah. They're further from each other. But, <laughs> right. Uh, and then try to identify some opportunity, because I don't think any of us are on our either end, but somewhere in the middle. But expect. where where in the middle are we, and what are the specifics of that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think if, if since you're a, a task force that's really advisory to the select board, that whatever report you make, you, must, you should give full reasons for whatever positions Yes. you arrive at, and also the reasons why you rejected other options. Yes. Because um, the deliberation and the final decision comes here. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, you know, and, but, you know. That's the, that's, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but that's the document that we're working on Good. right now. Good. Okay. All so right. So for each of the, I think there's nine alternatives, and some of them have several sub-alternatives. You know, it's in very rough stage, so mm -hmm. we haven't wanted to release it publicly because we're still drafting it. Oh, yeah. Um, but for each one, we're talking about the pros and cons, what the next steps are, and what outstanding questions there are. So that's what we're reviewing and putting together. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly appreciate, and I'm sure the rest of the board does, that, that extra level of deliberation. And if it takes longer to get this right, then do it, because um, this is really going to be something that's been impacting for a long time. And so get it right. So I appreciate that. So good. Thank you, Heather. Along the lines of the uh, recommendation that they've brought to us uh, via the infrastructure committee, uh, what what are thoughts on on that recommendation? Uh, we do have several several options. We could we could uh, endorse that recommendation. We could. We could uh, decline to, to move on that at this point, or we could wait and kick it back to them, awaiting the, the recommendation, of the final recommendation of the task force, mm -hmm. kind of some of the options there may be others I'm not thinking of. Mm -hmm. uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts? How would you like to proceed on, on this recommendation? Do you want to go first? No, go ahead. Okay. So, um, so one thing that I thought was beneficial f in considering this option is um, as more time has passed, I do think we're, you know, as I stated in my memo, exceeding the temporary status. Um, and let's say, let's say we're, the, crew, the task force is successful in coming up with a recommendation. Let's say if we, we, we get something by January. Um, I don't think any of the, options we have are going to be no cost, right? Everything's, no. everything's going to have some cost. How much is highly debatable <laughs> right now. So we have to include that in the budget somehow. We have to have discussion in town meeting. Kathleen, when is the final budget? Usually by the end of January, right? Yeah. For, you know, the final budget at the end of January. So if we don't have a recommendation <coughs> until the end of January, and that's, that's hopeful at this point. It's not included in the budget for fiscal year um, 2021. So if there's no money, then it's not going to happen. So now we're talking about getting something done in, you know, 21-22, and <coughs> we're pushing six years on a temporary closure. Um, I think this proposal helps rectify that situation of temporary and buys us a little time and opens up the road and until we until we can identify what we're going to do how we're going to pay for it and when it's going to happen so do we, did we have a cost estimate on doing this uh, I think Bill had given us a um, verbal estimate of around 12,000 for the south section right no, for the guardrail so yep. the, has the, on the north one already installed? I don't believe so. Yep. 
Kathleen, do you know the timing uh, when they've scheduled to do the north? They were scheduled initially in late October, and um, it's been delayed uh, for unknown reasons, but they're still expected this fall yeah. for the north end. And those are for used guardrails. The $12,000 estimate was for used guardrails. It's unknown if there are used guardrails available uh, the for the south well. end. And how often do the this task force meet? The last time you met was in September, or is that correct? No, no, we met we met last Friday. Okay. Uh, we met last Friday. We met in October, and then um, before that, I think it was September. So once a month, basically. Yeah. Yeah. We've had, it was spent even with a mm -hmm. small committee. It's been a little bit of a struggle mm -hmm. to um, find yeah. times for all four of us to get together. That's a difficult issue. Uh, it continues to really perplex us. And um, we know that people value that road, both recreational users and, and others that live on that road. So we also know that we have severe rain events that are continuing to undermine that road. We don't want to throw money away. It makes it very difficult to plan for the future of this road. Nick? Going back to your original question, Brian, I, I look at this and I, I sort of understand where it came from, but I don't think that was really the part of the charge of the group. Um, it's to, it, may, it may be one of the recommendations that ultimately comes out of it, but to act on this right now, I'm not in favor of that. I would, and yeah, it has been slow going, and, but I feel at this point we're moving at a fairly good solid pace now there aren't, and I don't foresee any reason for delays so at this point I'm not uh, um, in favor of endorsing this recommendation I would rather wait until we get the, the full range of options because the other thing we don't know is how much additional dynamic load may be put on that road that could in, in fact endanger it at a rate a rather an increased rate which was something that certainly Chief Hanley raised in his memo Just to note, the southern section is in much better condition than the northern section. So. No, but I think the, the issue is putting more of a dynamic load on the northern section with additional through traffic. Mm -hmm. Dean Rayom, I'm on the task force. A um, little history to go back. What you can speak into to, the mic, Dean. What we're trying to address here um, goes back to a legal issue that a bunch of us brought up back in 2016. And we followed state statute because the town did not follow state statute in closing that road. There is a process for that. It's laid out. It's in black and white. It's a class three highway. Um, it has to be maintained, has to be open to the public for all forms of travel. A uh, group of citizens signed, it's not a petition, but it's a, um, under 19 VSA 971, we got our signatures, we brought it to the board, you have 72 hours to make your corrections and open the road. That was in 2016. It's been closed since. Uh, Gate management has been horrible. Um, <coughs> landowners have had access trouble. And so part of this process, we recognize that. And I think what we're trying to say is the town's in a, a tough legal spot here. And a lot of us feel that what they did is illegal. We need to step back, correct that, start over, follow the process do it correctly, and it buys everybody the time, including the task force, to work to an end, ending solution. So that's where we're at by bringing this forward. We recognize a mistake was made. This is a way that we recommend we correct it and continue on working through this. As far as the integrity of that road, like Heather said, the northern section that's been closed is the best section of that road right now. 
and the integrity of the road, there's literally hundreds of loads of feed and fertilizer that use that road every season. Since the gates have been put up, the farmers have been cropping down there. They've been back and forth. You know what that equipment weighs, Brian. Knops getting their feed in and out of there. Goodriches getting their feed in and out of there. Fertilizer. We know what these farm trucks weigh. We know what these manure spreaders haul. To say the integrity of that road is an issue, I'm not seeing it. You're talking about the southern section, right? Both sections. No, but I mean uh, the part that's gated is what you were talking about. That's in better shape. That is in better shape. It has been the whole time. And that's a section that's been closed. It's that's frustrating. The, that's a section a where there's people. not residences on, though, right? There's landowners, and there's residents but that the want land to travel owner, through The there. landowners only need periodic access. But it's a state class three highway. The citizens have a right to travel unabated over that road. It's in the statutes. It's a class three highway. You can't just arbitrarily block it off. I've seen I've seen it's roads black and white. The, the Bethel the town has the Bethel an obligation road, to Dean, maintain. I, I it. got it. I got it. I'm not afraid of that. So it, we're trying to do the right thing, and we're trying to keep people safe. And we took an action based upon the recommendation of, of the senior staff and I think it's defensible in court and you know I think if we came down to it if the town wanted to vote on it maybe it's time to to do a poll and see if the town values it enough to, to put the couple million dollars into a road that's it, we're looking for creative solutions in grant money we had hoped we were going to get some grant money uh, we didn't. The grant money wasn't available. Are we still actively pursuing that? No, we haven't lately because we're trying to figure out what we're going to do with it, which is why we established the task force. Um, so I, I hear the saber rattling, but I, I let, let's just see where the board sits on this. So <coughs> thoughts from the board. Are you, are you looking for a motion? Or you, we, uh, well, any questions or, you know, wh where do we want to go on this? Because uh, we're, we're just before winter now. Yeah. You know, if we were going to do it. Um, <clears throat> well, my preference, again, is to let, let this task group do their thing and let's, let's not add to the load on that, the, the potential damage to the road. Let's keep it gated. And then we'll let them figure off, you know, come through with their solutions, and then we can proceed on, and, and have the discussion as to which is the preferred option to go to. But um, you know, at this point, you're not cropping it. Uh, it's I can't. It seems that everybody is still able to get into town. I mean, it, in many respects, I have to say it, it looks to me like a convenience road right now, for most, because uh, there's still ways in the town. So I would rather just do this right, and I'm. Uh, I'm not in favor of the, the task group's uh, recommendation at this point. I would make one argument to that. We're doing more damage to that road by not maintaining it right now. And state law says you need to maintain that. And by not maintaining it, not grading it, not doing anything down there, it's getting worse and worse. And that's going to cost you more in the long run. Talk about from the farm traffic. Uh How's it? The getting? grass is growing in. The oh. farm traffic's heavy. They use it. They need to use it. They pay taxes to use it. And that road has not been graded in years. It finally got mowed this summer. Finally. But it hasn't been graded. Hasn't been graveled. And that's what's making it worse and worse down there, is the lack of maintenance that the town is supposed to be doing. At this point, I'm inclined to open it um, to accept the recommendation. I was encouraged by Chief Hanley's note that it's not a very high traffic road, and he wasn't particularly concerned about that. And I was also, um, you know, taking note of what Chief Shaw said about access for emergency vehicles, that it would be easier if the road were open. 
I think some of the, the cost that would be associated with opening the road now would be uh, costs that we would probably wind up doing, not the guardrails, but some of it, even if we are going to maintain it for leisure purposes, I think we'll wind up grading the road um, at least one more time. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm inclined to accept the committee's recommendation. That doesn't mean I'm inclined to, in the future, say, yeah, we're going to put forth all this money to maintain it open permanently. I'm, I'm not saying that, but I think um, given that, given the timeline and given, um, you know, how long it's going to take for something to happen, it sounds to me like the road can be safely opened. And I think that would be the right thing to do until we have a recommendation. Um, because while most people don't use that road on a daily basis, some people do. And in a rural area like ours, I think it's important that even people living, you know, on streets with a couple houses feel like the town is going to be responsive to their needs. So. I know, I think I was inclined the same way, you know, um, and I'm hoping that it doesn't become a, an excessively used road, and I don't think that it would because of the nature of the road, and I know. Um, that it, it might be worth the experiment to see how it functions. It is important to know that the gates were open for the majority of the summer. And a big part of the summer they were open and everybody tr that used to travel uh, traveled it all summer long with no issues and I saw everything from fuel delivery trucks to UPS to the mailman traveling through there just fine and everybody was happy as could be so I know but that's important and you know uh, that's just an observation that we all saw what about summer. the concern of increased traffic though that's what we're worried about yeah. on a road I, that's I just, not I just wanted you to know that that's mm -hmm. what took place this summer it's a pleasure of the board anybody care to make a motion sure um, and I and I hear this but I think we still need to go through the procedure properly in the process <clears throat> so I'm gonna make a motion that we take no action on the recommendation refer the matter back to the task force with the instructions to complete the task that they have at hand before we make a decision. I'll second that. Motion uh, made and seconded. Are the comments on the motion? Anybody feel strongly different? I'm in favor of the motion. You're in favor of the motion? Yeah. So um, my, my only thought on this is we're getting ready for winter and I don't know when we could, if we haven't even got the ones in that we already, that we appropriated funding for several months ago, when, do you, when could we get those guardrails in you, realistically? I would like to know that because if we can't get them in right off, I'd rather wait until after the spring spring rains and put them in if we we're going to do that. I haven't heard of a timeline update from um, yeah from Bill, so. I actually had thought that was a potential for a longer-term solution, even. Be. That, that's what we're saying. That's why we're yeah. bringing this forward to get it opened up for a yeah. longer term for the town to really spend their time. This is a big decision. It's huge. <coughs> Precedent setting. This was one of our recommendations to gain that time to make sure it's done right because it hasn't been up until now it has not been done right and it's been not been done according to state law how this late corrects the, that how late in the year can they put those guardrails in 
I would say it depends on if the road's frozen. I don't, I don't know. I don't yeah. know, but I would imagine that it has. There's other options if you don't can't pound a guardrail in. Put some Jersey barriers up. Yeah, put I some hurricane. Yeah, but we're, we're talking know. about a one-time expenditure with putting. I mean, the, the recommendation was to put in the guardrails, and they would be there until we changed. Put in right Jersey barriers, and then go in and have to go pull them out and put the guardrails in. Yeah, and I think when Bill made his initial recommendation, um, he had researched Jersey barriers and some other type of. Um, like water filled barriers and stuff and he did not recommend that option. So. I, th I think they were more expensive, quite a bit more expensive. We talked about that. <coughs> okay, uh, so I guess we'll go ahead and vote on the motion. All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Opposed. Opposed. Okay, and I'm, I'm uh, I guess I'm going to break the tie, and I'm going to go ahead and, and say no action at this time because I want to see your your going to recommendations going to come in before we could put those in. And I would support it if we have a recommendation with it's a timeline that's an extended timeline um, that we're and then we're going to, and the recommendation is to keep the road open. If the recommendation is to close the road, which is one of the options. Then I wouldn't spend the money on it, on that, to to open that back up just to close it back down. The money's there. This was the first recommendation of the task force to you, which I, was our charge. No, well, your charge was for a, to okay. find a, a long-term solution, not not in-term solutions. The charge was to make recommendations to yep. the select board. Okay. Thank you. Derek. So Derek's of Encore Renewable Energy, and uh, he's going to present to us uh, rec a uh, initial brief on a five megawatt solar project off of, off of South Street Extension in collaboration with Middlebury College and Green Mountain Power. No, fake on it. For <coughs> For those of you that are standing, there are some additional chairs in the other room. If any of you would like a chair, there's an extra one you can pull There's that an up. extra one here. Yep. Good evening, folks. <clears throat> Thanks so much for having us. Uh, my name is Derek Moretz. I'm Chief Development Officer for Encore Renewable Energy. <clears throat> we are a renewable energy company based in Burlington. And uh, with me, I've got Jake Clark, uh, project manager for this uh, project proposed on South Street. We've also got uh, Mike Boucher. He's a landscape architect and land planner with TJ Boyle and Associates that's been supporting the project. There's also a number of folks here from Middlebury <coughs> College that's um, been leading the, the project team in looking at um, alternatives to this proposed site and ultimately um, uh, bringing different elements of the college together to, to really show how a project can be developed responsibly and, uh, and, and appropriately. So, um, I'm going to be fairly brief. I want to yield some time for good discussion and potentially others that have some perspective. Um, and um, maybe before I get too far into our site selection and alternative analysis, I'll kick it to Jack Byrne, who's the head of sustainability at the college, to provide some context as to um, how this project fits in with the college goals. So, Jack, uh, if you care to take a few minutes. Thank you. Um, nice to be here. I've been at Middlebury 14 years, and I don't know if I'm embarrassed or proud to say this is my first select board meeting. <laughs> um, so I wanted to just give you um, a sense of the, the origin of this project and some of the context um, around it. And um, we kind of start with why 
um, the college exists today. Uh, how, how do we think about what our mission is? And um, this is a relatively recent revision of our mission um, that essentially, um, through learning, immersive learning, we're pre preparing our students to lead engaged, consequential, and creative lives, contribute to their communities, and address the world's most challenging problems. And you probably know um, the history of the recent history of the college. Um, we have been quite concerned about climate change and about how institutions of higher education demonstrate leadership, demonstrate action in addressing what I think is fair to call now a climate emergency. Some of you may have seen the news that a week ago 11,000 scientists called for uh, viewing climate change as an emergency and that in their estimation that you know, we have uh, somewhere in the order of a decade to really start to significantly <coughs> transform our society from a fossil fuel based one to a renewable conservation and efficiency society. And so um, this is certainly something that has been heavily on the minds of a lot of our students. They've been very uh, instrumental over the years in moving the college leadership to adopt things like carbon neutrality by 2016 back in 2007, uh, which w we worked on and, and achieved. Um, so we're um, uh, kind of on the heels of the carbon neutrality initiative. Uh, Lori Patton, our president, said, what's next? What should we be doing to demonstrate leadership in this area? And the response, uh, over, which was developed over a two-year period, thank you, is um, what we're calling Energy 2028. Um, it is, uh, very comprehensive answer to what, it, what does a higher ed institution do about climate. Um, it has four major components um, that by 2028 we get to 100% renewable sources of energy and that's across our heating and electric uh, needs. So how do we heat and power the campus? Uh, cutting our consumption by 25% uh, through a whole variety of, of means. Uh, taking our <coughs> um, endowment out of fossil fuel investments uh, to zero dollars. That's on a, a slightly different schedule. Uh, by 2028, we anticipate being about 75 percent out and then 2033 fully out. And that's partly because of the commitments we've made in investing now that if we pull out early, we'll be penalized pretty heavily for. And then finally, the, we integrate the educational mission of the college with this effort that we use our research and our curricular and our <coughs> uh, student uh, um, efforts to help support and achieve these goals. Um, the, 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 uh, you may know we're doing an anaerobic digester project with the Goodrich Farm in Salisbury. We are the, will be the purchasers of renewable natural gas that will be generated uh, when that project is complete, and you probably know we are using biomass as a fuel source. So um, between those two projects on the thermal side, we'll be about 100 percent renewable. Um, the project we're talking about today uh, would provide about 30 percent of the electrical needs of the college. Uh, we're currently at about 8 percent with solar with a number of projects that we've done. Um, I just want to mention, uh, in finishing, uh, before I turn it over, that um, <clears throat> this initiative uh, passed. Uh, our trustees, who are you know, quite thoughtful and, and many of them <laughs> very cautious about things like divestment and, and making some very significant transformations in the way the college operates, uh, were unanimous in their support of this. And one of the things we heard from the, some of the trustees is uh, that the, this time the arguments resonated more with them because of conversations they'd had with children or grandchildren <coughs> about their perceptions of the climate issue and that their generation, these younger 
people are inheriting uh, this problem and are going to have to live with and solve it to the best of their ability and that they need every possible tool that we can give them. Um, and so that, that was sort of um, the, uh, one of the major impetus for adopting this. And I will uh, end there and turn it back over to our Encore team. Thanks, Jack. So um, as many of you are aware, we are proposing a five megawatt AC solar project at uh, the, the proposed field in the South Street uh, extension. I'll come back to the, um, the, the details of the site, but I did want to take a minute to talk through kind of some alternative sites that were considered. Encore came to um, the table a little less than a year ago after Jacks and the project team have had looked at a number of sites under control by the college. Um, that included uh, rooftops, um, parking lots, um, brownfields, and the like around campus. But then they quickly realized that they were not going to achieve the scale to meet their 2028 vision um, from these smaller sites. And so they looked at other land holdings uh, in the community. Um, and beyond and um, narrowed the field down to these eight sites that are on the slide here. Um, I could go into detail, um, but I guess in short, the, this list was narrowed down to the, the two sites off South Street. Originally, or previous to this site, there was the Upland site, we'll call it site two here. Um, it was Originally, the preferred location, we engaged some uh, consultants and experts to look at a number of factors, um, geotechnical analysis, uh, the site design and layout. We looked at aesthetics with T.J. Boyle and Associates. We looked at uh, some archaeological sensitivity with the um, <coughs> Division of Historic Preservation. And among each of those factors, uh, we, we did um, come to the conclusion that this lowland site was the least impact alternative. And uh, again, we can come back to some of these alternates uh, if time allows, but I just want to provide some background on what we look for in uh, site selection. You know, Encore was founded on the, the premise of um, focusing on underutilized properties uh, in Vermont. And we've made a business for developing landfills, brownfields, rooftops, and, and, and the like. And we've done 60 or 80 of those projects in the state. <clears throat> but what we found is to reach our climate commitment and our stated goals, um, both as a state and the, the, the goals of our clients, we did need to work with um, farmers and communities um, to unlock the potential of some of these larger greenfield sites. Um, <coughs> so other, and I'll also mention that the college has tapped out the opportunity that net metering provides. As um, the town knows very well, you know, we've developed sites uh, net metered <laughs> across uh, Addison County, and um, the customer cap is limited at 500 kilowatts AC. So the college has done everything they can within that framework, and um, to really make a, a dent in their um, carbon footprint, they are seeking. Um, a larger project. Um, you know, just to put it in context, one five megawatt project would be equivalent to obviously five um, one megawatt sites or, um, you know, 50, uh, 100 kilowatt sites. So you can get a sense of um, <coughs> the potential for solar sprawl or fragmentation of land as you look to take a single proposed five megawatt site and distribute it among um, the campus or the community. So um, we did look at economies of scale <coughs> to get to a, a price point uh, in collaboration with Green Mountain Power and the college um, to uh, address the avoided cost of the alternative um, and not subsidize this project on the back of other ratepayers. Uh, we looked at interconnection feasibility among these sites. Um, these circuits are becoming more and more constrained, um, and 
we also look at critical infrastructure and load that could potentially be isolated to uh, a, a, a microgrid or an island in the event of an outage. It's really part of uh, Green Mountain Power's initiative to promote resilience to critical loads such as Porter Hospital. Uh, we look at uh, archaeological sensitivity, both above and below ground resources. We look at wetlands, rare threatened and endangered species, uh, critical habitat, um, and the like. Prime ag soils is a big one, particularly in the Addison Valley, where you have large tracts of land. Um, we see solar as a means of um, preserving the integrity of the soils uh, for the next generation, and uh, the college in particular has, um, has, has advanced an initiative to deploy pollinator-friendly species to uh, the, the cover crop of the project, and we are looking at ways to, um, to, to really innovate the, the symbiotic use of solar with agriculture on this site in particular. Um, I mentioned uh, geotechnical uh, complex terrain was one of the um, one of the flaws of the upland site. Uh, you've just got bedrock, which is very difficult to build a solar project on, especially given the the complex terrain, um, site access, um, ground cover, exposure to the south is critical, um, and this proposed site in particular does lend itself towards a single access tracker technology, which can yield roughly 20% more renewable energy. Um, we look at the site control, the legal aspects, the regulatory constraints of developing on, on properties, um, alternative development potential, um, and orderly development. Ultimately, how does this project comply with the town and regional plans? Um, aesthetic impacts is one that uh, rises to the surface among the constituents. You know, we've had uh, a road show of sorts um, with neighbors and the community, and uh, that seems to be the, the number one concern of these projects, um, both from public vantage points and private vantage points. Um, we've looked at a GIS analysis of uh, this site and in relation to the upland site, and um, have come to find that the upland site does provide uh, wider spread visibility um, from the region as opposed to the lowland site being more isolated views to South Street. Um, also the skyline effect, the upland site does, um, as seen from east and west, um, skyline the horizon, um, whereas the lowland site does uh, have a backdrop as seen from the north and from the east that does not actually um, impose on on the skyline which is um, is included in the regional plan um, so we can talk specifics and what we're proposing to screen the site um, this here is a preliminary view shed of the upland site you can see in purple it does cast a broader uh, view shed um, from Route 30 to the west and um, well to the east as well, uh, including to the north, whereas the lowland site um, impacts are more concentrated to the South Street extension. Um, also mentioned that it's flat as a pancake, um, not completely flat, but the views along South Street are planar, whereas the upland site is um, again skylined um, so again these are all preliminary um, preliminary layouts it's a work in progress we're here tonight to solicit feedback and questions but um, w again this is the rough footprint of the project we've proposed uh, a healthy row of deciduous and evergreen plantings along the northern extent to um, mitigate impacts from uh, South Street to the north, as well as some residences, including the East View commu community. Um, and we have here some uh, renderings. We also have a, a, a printout on the conference table if folks get a chance to look at that, but it's a, a higher resolution version than what you're seeing here. So again, this is from South Street looking south. Um, you can see the uh, forested wetland beyond the site. Um, 
this is a, a rendering of what the single axis tracker technology would look like relative to the backdrop um, without screening. And then uh, when screening is proposed, um, at least as we've proposed it now, this is very open to input. Um, it would be, um, it, it, the screening would, would take and over time uh, um, soften the impacts from uh, South Street and the nearby abutters. Um, so I guess I'll leave it there. We do have some more information to share, but I did want to give a uh, chance for Q&A from the board or others. So board first, Nick. Thanks for the presentation. Um, <coughs> and I get it. I mean, I, I see the impact of the climate issue with the agency I work heavily for and all over. And, but I, it's kind of a little bit of a technical question. Is it's five megawatts. <coughs> and I, you know, we keep seeing more solar arrays pop up and I, I get it. But what does it realistically give on an <coughs> You know, what's the reliability? I mean, I look at today, and I don't think you'd be generating five megawatts. Um, and I see these things popping up in our climate. But I don't see them in Utah and Arizona and places like that where they get a reliable sun through the day. So I guess the one question I have is, where does the power come from when these things aren't generating? That's a good question. So to your first point about, you know, the southwest, th there, there has been significant development of utility scale <coughs> solar in the desert of the southwest, um, transmitting the power to Southern California and the like. I think the reason we don't hear or see much of them is because they are in the desert and uh, taking up thousands of um, acres of, of land as opposed to rooftops and, and backyards. Um, but to your resilience point, I mean, it, clearly it's an intermittent resource, requires the sun to shine to generate power. Um, what we've seen in Vermont is with the deployment of solar, we have been fairly effective at reducing our peak demand when the sun is shining. Um, but as far as storing that energy and addressing um, the coincident peaks of consumption, um, there's been a lacking component, and that's battery storage. So Green Mountain Power has been a leader in um, early energy storage projects. They've got three or four in operation. This would be um, their next in line. So what we're proposing is a two megawatt battery component that would store the solar energy and deliver it to the grid, um, coincident with when the power is being used. Um, so realistically, it's a two megawatt plant. No, so it would be generating full five megawatts when the sun is shining at full output, mm -hmm. but um, the battery would be a sink or a tank of that energy mm -hmm. to take some of that energy and uh, offset or push forward. Um, so again, the total plant could potentially generate seven megawatts, five solar, two battery, but say the sun is down um, we could store the solar energy and inject two megawatts from the battery to the grid uh, after the sun is down. No, and I, and I get that part, but again, it's kind of like, okay, if you have an extended period when the sun is down, the battery durations are, were a long time, I suspect, before they're going to have really long duration. I, I'm actually, my, my um, daughter's in grad school at Cornell, so they're doing a huge amount of work at this as a major research university. So where does the power come from for those extended durations? Yeah. In Vermont, predominantly it comes from uh, large hydro projects so in, Qu in Quebec or nuclear projects out of state. So we, we remain exposed to out of state and <coughs> in some cases dirtier okay. uh, forms of mm -hmm. energy. Okay, thanks. Could you, I'm sorry, Brian. Go ahead. Um, could you speak to why the industrial site wasn't considered? It was like number seven on your list. Sure. Sure. So the industrial sites come up a number of times in discussions, and um, I mean, you did consider, but why it wasn't we did, appropriate? Yes. So there's a number of reasons. Number one is there's a network of wetlands that would uh, prevent the project from achieving the scale um, to reach the college's goals. Um, there was some subdivision issues that would need to be uh, ironed out, but ultimately. Um, 
when we look at the town plan and look at the function of that industrial district um, with some of the infrastructure that is available there, um, it's, it, it didn't seem to be the higher and better use of the property um, as referenced in the town plan, which is to promote manufacturing um, and job creation. Um, so there's a number of reasons, but those are a few. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other from the select board? Uh, yeah, I have to comment on that. Um, I really appreciate the college taking this initiative. 100% uh, renewable energy, who doesn't want that, right? Which is good. But I'm just surprised that there's a, uh, there's a lot of feedback which concerns citizens about the location of this property. Have you done enough to convince them about this location? Mm -hmm. Or you have a chance, there's a lot of people here who came and we had received a lot of emails about the concerns they have. Sure. So can you address them? Yeah, so again, this is a work in progress. We're here to solicit feedback. We've, we've, um, we've knocked on doors. We've uh, had a, an open house to have similar, you know, smaller discussions. Um, there are certain things we can do to further mitigate the project, but ultimately um, the, the general consensus um, well, I, w I wouldn't use that word, that folks want clean power but not in their backyard, right? So this project is uh, an attempt to strike a balance between finding a site within um, town limits that's proximal to where the power is being used, right, where there is existing infrastructure and space that could be mitigated from the nearby abutters. So that's our goal is to continue this process and do anything we can to um, demonstrate that this is a responsible location that can be effectively screened um, for some of those aesthetic impacts. Um, and, and ultimately, there, there are very few, given its proximity to the town center. Um, if you look at many other locations in town, um, we had seen more receptors that would be impacted than this location. Could we bring up the picture again that shows the screening? This one or the? No, uh, the one that shows. Um, the view with the, 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 the view with the growth. The covered page. page. She wants the one where you. Where no, you no, for the down. Next one, I think that shows well, maybe that's it. Does that show the screens in place with? I don't think that's a screen. That's it. That's no. it. Okay, that, yeah. that one. So that still provides Vista, you know, like, and um, we have gotten a number of comments from people um, wondering if the, if the college could have pursued another site, maybe not in Middlebury or Addison County, but another site that could meet the criteria of putting in a five megawatt array well so I guess with regards to the siting of this and the collaboration with Green Mountain mm -hmm. Power and the college the, 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 the parties are looking to find a, a local locally mm -hmm. sourced generator that can um, minimize distribution and transmission from the project to the load right um, to Nick's point, you know, and to your point too, and I think that's the most compelling, one of the more compelling arguments for having it here, um, in terms of creating a microgrid, as you said, so that there would be um, security for energy for big users like Porter and the college. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that is a very compelling argument. We do know, um, and even those that are concerned about this particular location agree that the climate crisis is alarming, it's urgent, it's astonishing, and we have to move rapidly. And I have to weigh that too, like do we just live with the aesthetics of this? Because we need it all, we need it all. We need it all now, you know, it's that urgent, it's that dire, we have to have it. And um, I, th I think, I ha have to say, I know a lot of you South Street residents are here, I, I really, I see solar arrays and I think I feel good about that. You know, I've gotten accustomed to seeing them, even large ones. I don't want it, um, I think it actually protects the land 
for agricultural use. And, and I, think, I think we should be considering this project. I'm sorry, I think we should. I think we need it. So, um, uh, in, in the, okay. What about, what about the, the, the Route 7 site? Why did you? Uh, let's see, which site is that? It's number eight. Number eight. I have here a um, preliminary layout of that site and you can see pretty quickly how um, inefficient the layout becomes when you have these non-geometric um, designs where they're quite elongated. Um, well, they're, they're geometric but slightly right. different. Yeah, so, so they're, they're just inefficient. Um, there were some wetlands on the site that were preliminarily identified and um, ultimately it was just not deemed a technically feasible site. Um, there were some aesthetic impacts from Route 7. There was a, a trail system uh, around this location and uh, again wetlands seemed to be a constraint that, that had been identified. <coughs> Can I get a show of hands of how many people are here about this particular topic? Yeah, I, th I thought so. So um, I hate to disappoint you, but there, we didn't have time for public interaction on this. This was kind of an early brief to the to the select board, uh, to, and uh, with the letters that we've received and uh, the the comments and and what was written in the paper, we're, we're well in tune to the fact that this is not a simple <coughs> project and it needs some process to be done right. And um, in discussion with uh, Kathleen, you know, our planning commission, we talked about solar at the select board several years ago after we saw what we felt that <coughs> some of our neighboring towns had, had uh, had done a poor job with it and we wanted to make sure that we were out ahead of it and had talked about it and so the, the Middlebury Planning Commission uh, was charged and came up with uh, you know, we had a task force and they came up with some consensus principles on on solar siting within uh, Middlebury. Uh, given that they're kind of our lead on that, uh, we, we'd like to see it go through the process of going to the Planning Commission and have Derek present that there. The Planning Commission can look at it um, in uh, regard to how it fits the, the principles and <coughs> there's uh, some good input from the Conservation Commission and um, that'll be an opportunity for you all to, to provide some feedback. And then when it comes back to the select board, um, and with any changes that the college and, <coughs> and uh, uh, the, the team decides to make in the project along the way, when it comes back to us, uh, we'll make sure we block a, a larger block of time so that we can, so we can accept uh, input at that time. Does that sound reasonable f for you? I, uh, in the interest of making sure those that we had put on the agenda have can, can get their business done tonight also. And, and I, this project is, you know, it's not ready to start to start building tomorrow. And, and they're, they're trying to follow, the college is trying to follow an open process. And I think we can help guide them through a process that'll make it a better project for the whole town. Um, is that reasonable for everybody? You, you okay with that? <laughs> Jay, I, I figured. <laughs> Sure, so high level schedule is we're very early in the process. We have filed uh, a 45 day notice, which is a statutory requirement uh, to be filed with parties 45 days ahead of the CPG, Certificate of Public Good filing with the, with the state. So I would say earliest case we're looking at um, mid-December, 
would be earliest case, um, could likely flow into uh, the first of the year. But again, we're, we're fairly early in this campaign and um, we, we do uh, welcome feedback from anyone in this room and, and beyond. Ultimately, it is a decision at the Public Utility Commission. We're not seeking a permit um, here, and uh, but we are seeking feedback. So. That would be filing a certificate of public good application at the Public Utility Commission. You, you were afraid it was uh, when they were going to start building. <laughs> yeah, I, I was wondering about that. Yeah, sorry, myself. just to clarify on the construction, <laughs> if all things, um, you know, go as planned or as proposed, we would be looking to uh, build the project later next summer. Good. Yes, the document was very good and informing, and I don't know if Encore has had a chance to see that document yet, have you? We just saw it today for the first time. Chris? Is it possible to get a breakdown of why the other sites weren't selected, or even uh, more of a detail other than just your say-so, um, why this is an acceptable, and also Yeah, so to your first question, we, we can share a more detailed breakdown of that alternative analysis with some of the criteria I mentioned. Um, relative to the uh, western site, I do just have a slide um, looking here as to what we did consider on the other side of the knoll, and we did see some fairly inundated uh, wetlands that, uh, that, that would prevent an efficient or a, an optimized design. Um, <clears throat> but I can share some more information as it's helpful. Can you point out exactly on that picture where the wetlands are so I we can walk and see and see it for ourselves? Yeah, so generally it's the southern portion of, of the, the field there. Right. This was a proposal for the upland site, and you can see how it kind of ran off the page because of some of the constraints with topography and geotech. Um, but I guess I'll just point to the southern extent. Well, it's on its side, so to the west, you've got some wetlands, but then as you come down around the field, you've, you've also got some class two wetlands. Quickly goes up a hill on both sides of that flat 
area um, from which the picture is taken. So I, I would like to see some, I, I would like everyone else to see, I see it every day, but I, I think it would be important for everyone to really see what the Duchette impact is. Yeah, that's helpful, and, and this is preliminary. We're, we're fairly early on, but there will be a more robust um, aesthetic impact assessment with multiple vantage points along South Street as part of our ultimate uh, filing. Okay. Actually, I, I, we need to move on, sir. Is it, is it urgent? Just a, just a quick question, sir. Okay. Good question. So we do need to perform that acoustic impact analysis as part of our CPG filing. Um, we have not done that yet, but it is part of the reason that we've located the battery and the array, you know, roughly a thousand feet from the road or any abutters. Um, it, it, you know, it's the inverters, the transformers. Um, it is just about, as you say, a, a refrigerator sort of hum. The battery, in, those will be enclosed in insulated containers <coughs> for mitigation. Um, and the inverters and solar transformer, those only make noise when the sun is shining, so it's not a, an overnight um, hum. But in any regard, there are clear standards which we will need to meet to stay below those thresholds. Thank you. Great. <coughs> Are you all in favor of supporting that process? Is that, is that workable? Can I? Yep. Um, you need a motion on that, Kathleen, to make that uh, our process adopted? You were just referring it to the Planning Commission for right. a comment. Right. Yep. Okay. Somebody, somebody care to make a motion for me? I'll make a motion that we refer the plan to the, the revised South Street Extension Solar Project and uh, to the Planning Commission and ask for them to prepare recommendations for the board's consideration. And um, I would also add that they consider um, comments from the Conservation Commission as part of that recommendation. Second. Okay, and what, our goal is to have the timeline to have it back to us for a December meeting. So, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. Thank you, Derek. Thanks, Derek. Thank you. <coughs> the Planning Commission will be reviewing that. And, so I think that... And then when it comes back to us, if there's any recommended, I mean... Well, I, I, what I said was we'll, we'll schedule more time at our next meeting here, but you, there's along the way you should have an opportunity. To, you know, all the letters and everything are going to the Planning Commission for, as part of the consideration. You know, the letters have been helpful on this, so keep them coming because it's been important. Yeah. At least. Jim. Hi, folks. Well, there was a time when this project attracted a room full of people. <laughs> <laughs> Is that progress if there was? Maybe that's, a, maybe that's progress. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. So, so I'm here tonight representing the Mobility Committee. This is a committee that uh, was formed by uh, VTRANS and the Regional Planning Commission to um, look at uh, um, managing accessibility, parking, and traffic, kind of above and beyond what VTRANS typically does uh, on projects. And so the uh, committee um, 
uh, includes representation from VTRANS, from the Regional Planning Commission, ACTOR, Neighbors Together, me, VHB. So we, we met a couple of times and have come up with some uh, recommendations uh, for the 10 week shutdown next year. And uh, those recommendations were presented to the Public Health and Safety Committee last month, uh, who endorsed it. Chief Shaw, Chief Hanley were both at that meeting. And so the next step is to come before the select board and, uh, and ask you to uh, review and endorse those recommendations as well. So if you've, you've received my agenda notes, which, which go over that, I think for the sake of anyone listening and just a quick summary, I'll, I'll um, go back through what the list uh, consists of. Uh, number one is to eliminate the left-hand turn from South Pleasant Street onto Cross Street uh, to um, in, uh, try to keep traffic flowing <coughs> on, on Cross Street. Um, all these recommendations, I, I should say, would be implemented on May 1st of 2020. Uh, and come to closure on August 31st of 2020. Signage, any signage that's involved would be paid for by the state of Vermont. So that's eliminating the left-hand turn from South Pleasant Street to Cross Street. Uh, number two has to do with uh, parking in the municipal lot. Uh, the team, the committee feels that uh, the Ilsley parking lot, the town, the lot behind the municipal building here, it will should be the go-to lot for folks who are coming downtown to uh, uh, to take care of business. And uh, so the recommendation is that the lower lot, as well as the upper lot, um, be restricted to three hours of parking. The upper lot currently is. The lower lot is all-day parking. Um, and so to be consistent, both upper and lower would be uh, three-hour parking enforced uh, by, by our parking uh, person. Uh, the lot behind CSAC and Mr. Ups would remain all-day parking, and as would uh, Mill Street and some of our other locations. Um, the committee also recommended that the 12 spaces behind Ilsley, directly behind Ilsley, be um, uh, set aside for seniors and children with uh, uh, families with small children, uh, like the co-op has done. Um, that recommendation may run afoul of uh, federal signage recommend, uh, regulations, MUTCD, and so that's being researched right now, whether we can actually put up signage to that effect. Um, number three, South Main Street. Um, during the three weeks when all the precast concrete is coming into town, um, um, our options are to either, uh, because you've got these oversized uh, pieces coming down, our options are either to close South Main Street each time a truck comes down or to eliminate the parking on South Main Street for that three week period. The recommendation is to do that. Um, I've spoken with the, um, uh, um, with the folks at Sanderson's Funeral Home and I'll talk about you know, their, their options in a minute, but uh, also talk to the college about that as well. Um, so the recommendation is roughly from June 7th to 27th, according to Kubricki's schedule, to shut down all parking from uh, Academy Street on up to Mahaney uh, Art Center. Uh, next is Franklin Street. That's the uh, kind of one block road that runs from the bottom of Academy Street up to the college. And the recommendation there is to turn it into a one-way street going up the hill toward the college and in the right-hand lane to put parking. Uh, that parking would make up for what's lost on South Main Street during the 10-week uh, shutdown. Um, and in addition, it would create more parking for folks coming downtown. It's what, a five-minute walk into the center of town from Franklin Street. A uh, number of spaces, we haven't plotted that out yet, but you know enough to make it worthwhile, I think. And the town, uh, again, this would run through uh, from May through August, but the town might want to consider whether that's a long-term solution, too. Um, Sorry, Jim. Yeah. Is that the road <coughs> on the east side of Twilight Hall, right up here? Mm -hmm. Right. So you come, like, where the buses are. Right. And so you would go right up the street, mm -hmm. but people wouldn't be able to. That's Franklin Street? Yeah, right. you Next come. Next to this traffic light. I just want to make yeah. sure I knew. The, how you'd access it is off of Academy Street, and then you'd come around where the actor buses are and turn right <coughs> up there. Okay. It goes right in front sure. of the library, right? It, it goes, up, the goes up to it. It dead ends at stores, uh, which yeah, is the road dead, yeah. behind the library. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next, actor, um, the state uh, committed to a, um, a continuous shuttle in town uh, to help folks get from one side of the town to the other while, while the town's cut in half. Um, they committed to that during the environmental assessment, which you may remember from, from last year. 
And so uh, Actor has proposed a shuttle that would run from the Marble Works uh, out uh, the back of the Marble Works, Elm Street, Seymour Street, stop at the post office, uh, continue on to Town Hall Theater, stop there, continuing down South Pleasant Street, take a right, come down the town offices, stop here, take a right, uh, go down Main Street, uh, past where things have been shut down and actually go to the center of town uh, and drop folks off there, pick them up and then um, uh, reverse. Uh, so that was the idea there is to kind of create a continuous 10-minute uh, shuttle uh, that will connect the two sides of town there. Um, and then the final piece is a, um, a series of bike racks that would be positioned uh, kind of strategically around town and I've uh, you know um, noted where those places would be to encourage those who want to get by around by bike to have uh, the bike racks to be able to uh, uh, park and lock their bikes too so so in total what you have here is a set of recommendations that kind of sit on top of uh, the transportation management plan that the VTrans has put in place um, the final thing I want to note here is that there um, their approach going into this is to try to anticipate everything that could go wrong and how to manage it, um, but to also be prepared to be nimble during those 10 weeks and to manage traffic and accessibility and pedestrians in real time. And to do that, they'd like to have access to the select board as needed um, if we need to make um, you know, quick decisions uh, to deal with bottlenecks or other issues that may come up during that 10-week period. I just have one comment. Sure. Um, I noticed in number two, that recommendation included uh, specifications for enforcement. Yes. But recommendation one didn't. And I'm concerned about making that recommendation without that piece. And I wondered, I know Chief Hanley's um, staff has, you know, it might add additional stress on his department to try to then enforce that also, but I'm worried that if we just put signs up there, what's pe gonna stop people from driving down there and trying to make that left turn? So the only comment, mm -hmm. I'm supportive of it, but if, but if nobody follows it, what, what good does it do us, you know? Um, I think it's gonna be very difficult to make that left-hand turn for starters, but um, Chief, did you Right, want? so people are gonna sit there trying to get in traffic to make or, that left-hand turn and it's gonna back things up. Um, or they're gonna turn, they're gonna figure we, out to turn right and go down to the roundabout and right, come back. Right, yeah. but how are we gonna, I mean to some, you know, I know, I know to some extent it's the same mm -hmm. deal with the covered bridge, you can't, mm -hmm fix bad decisions but you know I'm trying to like I just it might is there anything we can do with that recommendation to try to support people making good decisions I guess yeah I don't think the police department has the manpower to put somebody there to to manage that intersection across the street there will be a flagger because there will be a lot of construction traffic coming out of the south end of the project out Water Street out still Water Street there and then turning left onto Cross Street. So Kubricki is has to put flagger a flagger at that intersection there. It's you know um, I don't know if they're there they would be committed to putting the flagger at the other end of the across the street from that to manage traffic on the left hand side. Maybe it's something we should consider for just high traffic t you know That's just what I was gonna say. just yeah. during school school and end of business that mm -hmm. we don't have to have somebody there all day mm -hmm. but during high traffic times maybe we consider it 7 30 to 8 30. do you think people are that i um, mean a, a, a fairly evident sign is going to prevent that i don't i think that people are going to try to get around mm -hmm. and cut corners wherever they mm -hmm. possibly can I find actually and if they think if, if traffic is backed up you see it now you know I've, I've driven through town when traffic's backed up by the mint at the end there mm -hmm. and what do people do they go down South Pleasant Street and they turn left and then they turn right onto uh, Charles Avenue and they try to get out by the by the high school right. they take alternate routes but right. the question um, is whether you have a sign that clearly indicates that there's no left turn I think people are fairly observant I, I <laughs> 
Mm. I would, Can uh, I ask a question? I'm sorry. Sure. A little remedial here. <laughs> so am I understanding that, that people aren't going to be able to turn left when they're driving north, but they can turn right when they're driving south onto Cross Street? No. No. If you're okay. going on South Pleasant Street to Cross Street, you cannot take right. a left. Okay. We can take a right and come around the rotary and go back. Mm -hmm. Okay. So South if you, Pleasant. so if you're okay. heading, if nope. You're got it. I got it. Yeah. I would say, Heather, that if the select board feels that that's important, I can go back to VTrans and Kabricki. Um, Kabricki is contracting with the sheriff's office to provide escort services for the precast concrete trucks that are coming in. Um, so they're already in discussion and, and contractual relationship with the with the sheriff's office. Um, maybe that's a possibility that during you know particularly for those three weeks when the project is underway and school's still in session, that's you know to manage that that joint intersection of where Water Street comes out and where South Pleasant Street hits Cross Street. I think I'm okay with us being aware of it and maybe dealing with it on the fly, but I just. I don't want to. I don't want to ignore it. I guess I just sure. want to. It's a problematic think it's a intersection. Potential that that even signs will not alleviate. You will have stress. adequate adequate signs, sufficient enough signs. I haven't <laughs> seen the signs yet. I'm trying to visualize what would be sufficient to keep people from trying to turn left there. So we'll have to look at that and see. You know what what makes sense visually. You know what's sufficient to keep people from turning left there? Some Jersey barriers. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Maybe, maybe. Uh, you know, we have the same conversation about the covered bridge, you know? Mm, I right. Mean, there's only so much, you, uh, there's only so much signs are gonna be able to do. Right, agreed. So, so let's see how it goes. Mm -hmm. he, he's saying like a Jersey Bridge that forces people to start yeah. going, right? Yeah. yeah. Maybe, kabrugi has got a few of those. Yeah, well, maybe. It would only take one. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's what we do. I was actually thinking more of those little flexible knock-down posts like over by the corner where Gary Baker's place is. You know, just those the reflective. The plastic the bollards or something? Yeah, yeah. that so may I've be. Seen, I've seen those used for that exact scenario as a temporary, but again, that's let's let the okay. pros figure that out. So with the caveat that we haven't solved everything yet, uh, there still will be world problems, and they're going to have access to us uh, throughout the construction period. Uh, pleasure of the board on, on their recommendation. Uh, Got our light back. That I'll, make okay. <coughs> I'll move that we endorse the mobility committee's temporary traffic flow and parking recs for the downtown during summer 2020 construction of the bridge rail project. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? A resounding aye. A resounding aye. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Doug Lazarus. Are you trying to figure out where it is? No, no, no. I, I get where it is. <laughs> In my head, it was Court Street, and I couldn't figure oh, out yeah. where it was. That doesn't make so this sense. is a follow-up to the board's October 8th discussion <laughs> um, on the proposed art display project, and we asked town manager Kathleen Ramsey to complete an analysis of that, and Kathleen is going to walk us through that. Okay. Um, just a second. So in, in keeping with the board's request, I went through uh, Mr. Lazarus's proposal and uh, quantified the amount of staff time required and the amount of costs that will be incurred uh, with each um, section of the uh, proposal. Detailed in a three page uh, analysis uh, in your packet, estimating a grand total of 90 hours of staff time and $12,450 uh, to implement the project um, in its total as proposed. Happy to go through with that with you in detail or an answer any questions you may have. Um, also, as requested, I completed my part of the project scoring sheet. The next step is for the select board to complete its portion of the project scoring sheet, and those are available um, in your packet. 
So in our packet, there's a, a bunch of supported documentation. I'm sure everybody's read it, but uh, the intent was to uh, get it out and and if we give provide an opportunity to ask a few questions if if we have any <coughs> um, and so that then uh, next week which uh, we have a, another meeting our regularly scheduled meeting uh, we would then uh, we would then make a decision and vote on this and so um, are there any any questions at this point or anything else that you need in your opportunity to deliberate on how we want to proceed on this. I just want to say thank you to Doug um, for bringing the project to us and, and helping us, again, um, value art in our community, which you did by bringing the project to us and that we're, as you see tonight, we're straddled with a lot of things. So. No, <laughs> you can see that. Uh, coming after Jim gave me the thought that there's so almost like a, a tie-in between my proposal and what Jim was just talking about, which is the, 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 disrupt, the disruptive nature of what's going to be happening in town for a while. And that the town will, in order for the downtown businesses to make it through all of that disruption okay, uh, something needs to draw people into town. Uh, uh, you know, because there'll be, word of mouth is going to be the same as it was for Brandon. Just stay out of Middlebury. Figure a way around it. Don't go in. Um, and uh, Brandon now is at the end of its five years. <laughs> um, uh, the, um, the, uh, the project that I proposed is really an art slash history project. It's celebrating uh, the people that Middlebury has produced over the years that have been significant and the historic nature of, 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 of the community. Um, it, because it's such an unusual project, it would be very, very uh, easy to get um, a lot of coverage for people to want to check it out. Uh, it could be, uh, it would be covered in travel, it could be very easily covered with uh, travel magazines, TV stations, and so on. Uh, as something to go take a look at this. And, uh, and, and it could even be done in a way that would depict the fact that the town is going through both a disruption and a celebration of itself. And it tie the two together so that you're not ignoring the reality of what's going to be happening. Um, I'm doing a project in Brandon now, and, um, uh, and WCAX sent people down, and they interviewed me. and and um, uh, Bernie Carr, and we, we did a walk through town, and he was talking about the project. Um, projects that are unusual and uh, celebratory uh, get, can get um, coverage. And so it's not just for the people who are living here. It, it, would, it would be a way to let people come to Middlebury, see, see this unusual thing. And it also would be uh, reminding people of the, some of the very significant people that um, came out of Middlebury. So it's a celebration of Middlebury taking place while there's a disruption going on. That's what I thought the appeal would be. Okay, so uh, with that, we'll, we'll uh, make sure you've read everything and absorb it and, and so that we can, can uh, debate or discuss and, and make a decision next week, okay? Oh, one last thing, and that is that I spoke to Jim Bingen up at the uh, 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 the uh, Lake Champlain Basin Program. I don't know if you know who they are, I guess, right? Uh, <clears throat> and Jim said that because um, he said if, I, he, he helped me with, uh, with two other projects that I worked on over the last number of years, so I, he knows me. And he said, well, the most money that we, you could get from us, because I see there's a figure of like $12,000 and change or something mm -hmm. for everything that Kathleen added up. Um, he said, um, uh, you could get $7,500 from the, you know, if you apply for a grant, and he sort of was saying that he thought it would be eligible for it, because it would be promoting Middlebury and in the painting of Battelle to show a, um, a vignette of the Morgan Horse Farm, which is right on the outside of town, he said, now you have two towns. If you only had one town, you'd be eligible for, I think it was 4,000, but because two towns would be shown in this thing, he said, I could push it through uh, and you could get the 7,500. 
So that money could be used for covering, um, I believe, for covering a good portion of the 12,000 in change um, that I saw as the bottom figure. Um, I don't know if there's any money uh, in the s from, the s from Middlebury itself that could go toward covering the balance of that. If not, then um, I'm, I've done it. If you took a look at the material I sent, I've done fundraising uh, and for, for, for a number of projects and uh, for more money than this project would be. I know, uh, I know a number of people here um, and um, my feeling is that th there, there could be a source for, for getting the other five thousand uh, dollars so that uh, 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 that money could be covered because that's an, it's, it's money it, you know it's going to cost <laughs> um, uh, I really appreciate the fact that Kathleen went to the trouble of you know really that's that she, that's a piece of work she had to do <laughs> that's that's what we've come to expect <laughs> yes but uh, the thing is that um, that's not in my mind something that's insurmountable for me I think that I you know uh, you know, I, I could find, uh, there could be funds found for that as well. And, and all of the other funds that I mentioned in the, in the proposal, uh, I'm gonna break the project down with a sponsor for each one of the panels. Should it turn out that I'm, a, I'm one panel short, so instead of eight panels, it could be seven panels. But nothing would begin until, you know, um, until the, the funds have arrived. I'm not going to start work until I've been able to raise all the money. Um, okay. All right. Thank you, Doug. Well, one, one thing, Doug, too, is, I mean, this is fascinating <coughs> to me, but I think the other thing to look at is not just the, the, the cost, but it's that 90 hours. Um, and I think, Kathleen, on the average work week, what are you working, 350 hours or something? And the staff does, so we have to make sure that there's a time in there with all the other things, but um, we'll do diligence. Oh, you mean even if the money, uh, oh, you weren't thinking that this wasn't? Uh, well, well there's, there's the money, but there's also just the time that of demand we put on, on staff, and we're, we're very cognizant that we don't overload them, because right. they already are. But um, nonetheless, we're gonna look at this carefully. And, and well, thank you. I appreciate exactly. the fact that you're entertaining it. <laughs> I, oh, no, absolutely. Thank you for bringing it forward. Thanks, thanks very much. I Any mentioned questions? this last time, Questions? sorry, yeah. just to interject before we end, and, and last time you were here I, I had mentioned this, but I think moving forward we might want to consider some sort of arts committee um, because I think this sort of project, bringing some dynam something dynamic to the downtown um, is something we really want to uh, pursue, but we also don't necessarily have the staff timing, so I think we should just consider regardless of what happens with this particular project, I'm just jumping in here, um, mm -hmm. putting together a committee that could vet things, look for funding, take some of the burden off of staff, um, that would look at all like the arts things that happen. Front. Exactly, exactly. So more things well like received. that could come yeah. and change and there could be something new mm -hmm. throughout the year to look at. Like an art and public places committee. Exactly, something Something like that. Yeah. A lot of ability to it. <coughs> that would be in no. instead of what I'm doing. Or no, no, I'm I'm just saying. Guide it. Regardless of oh, your particular, oh, I'm just, just jumping in because it's just it's a, a little general. tangent, yeah, 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 yeah. Tangent <laughs> a related thought. tangent. I got you. Um, moving forward. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm uh, you know I'm I'm very enthused about doing this obviously, and uh, anything that I can do to make it come to pass. I'm more than willing to do. Uh, you know, I don't know, you know, what that might be, but w anything within my purview, I'd be more than happy to uh, to get involved in it. Um, I don't see the fine the time element is, is a factor that I really wasn't thinking so much of. I was just thinking about the money, uh, you know, raising the money mm -hmm. and stuff. Okay, I, I I don't mean to be rude, but we we do we're you're, you're over time. 40, <laughs> 40 minutes behind schedule gotcha. here, so. <laughs> okay, thank you all very thank much. Thank you, Doug. Hi, Dave. Are oh, you still here? <laughs> <coughs> I came and got more than I bargained for. <laughs> yeah. Funny how that works. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can't remember the last time I was here about this particular project, the Middlebury Hydro, but it's been a few couple months, wasn't it? Been like, has it been a couple months? I don't know. That was a couple of years, but anyway. 
Um, uh, yeah, I thought it was this year or something. Maybe it was. Anyway, whatever. Um, there's been some discussions I've had with uh, the Holmes brothers, and they are um, there. There's a number of people are showing greater interest in their project. And if you recall, we had entered into a term sheet agreement with them, a non-binding agreement back in February of 2015, which we actually with. I know that's why. Uh, we withdrew from it, and that's when I was here, I think, last sometime earlier in the year. We withdrew it from it because... 15? No, no, no. 2015 oh, was oh, when oh, the we original signed, term yeah, sheet was yeah, yeah. signed, and it was only good for five years, so it would expire. That it would normally have expired this, this coming yeah, February. Yeah. Um, but we withdrew from that agreement uh, earlier this year so that right. we felt we could talk to other possible developers about the yeah. site on the opposite side of the river. Um, but now that the uh, Holmes brothers seem to have renewed interest in to finalizing their permit, um, they wanted a letter of support from us uh, for the project to send to, f to the Federal M Energy Regulatory Commission. And I, talking to Kathleen and to council, um, felt that we needed to renew the term sheet, um, which we sent a draft to the Holmes brothers last week mm -hmm. last week yep. I was kind of hoping they were going to sign right away because I did talk to Eric and told him about the two changes that we were going to have from the original those two changes are basically on item do you have copies of this yeah it's in the packet it's, it's in the, pa yeah, the, right, term, anyway. the term sheet we've got we referenced that we were going wanted uh, energy credits some form of energy credits for the project to be applied to the town office building mm -hmm. Um, the Holmes brothers are completely on board with the town benefiting from the project if it moves forward. And I just said that we were going to change it from and the... And we shifted to the rec... We shifted it to the rec building. That yeah. states it here. The other piece in the original term sheet was on item 7, relationship of the parties. It's, it said that the Middlebury Electric would be the sole owner and operator of the project. And I eliminated that sentence from this new term sheet because there's a possibility that uh, once the permit is ob obtained that m a developer may take over the project and the, home and the Middlebury Electric would not necessarily be the sole owner. So we didn't want to box ourselves in. No. So anyway, we're here to just request that uh, we can move forward and get this signed. This has been something we've been working on for a long time. We've been on the board for 10 years and we've been talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> and it sure be nice to see. Well, yeah. just keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. No, this is good. <coughs> it makes yeah. sense to me. Yeah, Pleasure like of the, the board. the proposed changes. I move to authorize town manager Kathleen Ramsey to sign the term sheet between the town and Middlebury Electric LLC for the Upper Falls Hydro Project. I'll second. Any questions or comments? There are none. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? <coughs> okay. Great. Thanks, Dave. Thanks so much. Thank you. Kathleen, okay. update on the budget. Uh, given the hour, I'm going to do an abbreviated report. Uh, we're, the budgets uh, in general are tracking about where we were last year at this time. The general fund is 49% expend, expended uh, compared to 48% last year at this time. Uh, that seems a little high given that we're 33% of the way through the fiscal year, but that's due to the prepayment of our capital improvements, the transfer to the capital improvement fund, our bond payments, and the payments out to agencies. Um, otherwise, we are um, on track. We have um, made some payments out for sand, $28,000 more than last year at this time, and uh, more out for salt, $37,000 more than last year at this time. So that's uh, my comment on the uh, general fund. Uh, equipment repair is still down from last year at this time. Uh, equipment parts are down $30,000 $30, with $17,000 out of $60,000 of that budget spent. And repair services are down uh, $6,000 uh, with 8500 spent out of a $50,000 budget. So we're looking good on both of those fronts last year. 
of this year. Um, Good news in the water department, maintenance of hydrants uh, expense is up by $7,900. That's something we've been uh, wanting to address over the long term. And maintenance of mains uh, contract services is down by $60,000 compared to last year at this time. And that's what I have for budget reports. We've had a pretty lucky year with not a lot of water main breaks, right? This year, yeah. I thought you were going to tell us we were over budget on the winter maintenance program and we'd only started today. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't quite ready for it. Any questions on the budget of Kathleen? Okay. Uh, next is a report on opioid class action suit and consideration <laughs> of whether or not to opt out. Kathleen lead us through that. So you have uh, in your packet a letter from Attorney General T.J. Donovan, uh, endor not endorsing, but um, urging towns to consider staying with the class action suit um, rather than uh, try to undertake a suit on its own. I also discussed uh, it with Benj and um, he, re he responded, as we discussed the other day, I don't see much upside for the town opting out. If it remains in the class action, the town might end up getting only a small settlement, if anything, but any legal fees and costs will be paid out of the settlement funds. If the town opts out, it will e likely either need to forego participation altogether or expend significant legal fees pursuing claims against a set of large and well-funded defendants. Mm -hmm. So I'm suggesting that we stay in the class action suit. Makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. So we have general it. consensus, a motion? <coughs> move that the town um, of Middlebury should not uh, opt out of the opioid <coughs> class action suit and should remain in the nego negotiation class. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. So next, uh, we've got the legislators coming um, next week. We do have some other. Uh, business now that so it won't only be the legislators uh, but uh, because we've had such a busy schedule and, and a lot of stuff but uh, opportunity to maybe make a list of things we want to discuss with them are there any are there any town issues that are that we want to solicit support for or I mean, what how would you like to proceed? Solar permitting. <laughs> yeah. The biggest uh, things we're talking about lately is the homeless mm -hmm. issue mm -hmm. in town with how the police department and the town safety and... Um, Definitely that. Littering. And that's something that the state legislators, they should take up and do something. I would say that's the top item. From what we're uh, hearing. Yeah. Uh, second of all is the issue of the local option tax and that percentage that the state takes, but as we understand, it was supposed to come back for the pilot. Right. So the town get re is uh, funded, but gets seventy percent of the local option back from the state, who collects the hundred percent and they retained 30%, and that 30% is used to uh, fund the payment in lieu of taxes program, uh, which is now fully funded, I understand. Hmm. To fund the payment in lieu of taxes. Right, so any state buildings that are in towns, uh, the town pays the town a, a payment in lieu of taxes. So instead of, since they take the buildings off our town rolls, uh, tax yeah. rolls, they reimburse us a certain amount. And now they have built up a significant nest egg to fully fund that? And from time to time, it, it's a 
it's eyed for rating for other uh, expenditures, and so we want to make sure we keep that um, the integrity of that fund for that purpose. Because it hasn't always been that case. No, correct. In fact, more recently, it sort of hasn't been that case. So are we asking them to take up? Just to send in more back to the towns than the seventy percent. <laughs> if I had my way, sure. <laughs> you know, it's, um, or they, it's a pretty I big mean, chunk they're taking. But. If the, if that that was earmarked for a specific use, that they had at some point have to take up what they're going to do with that funding, for right. those excess funds. So. I had a conversation with Nick about that, and he was suggesting that if there is any surplus in that local option tax fund, that perhaps the additional services provided by hub communities uh, for homelessness and other uh, social issues, that might be a potential funding source. Okay. So I had also, I had reached out to the legislators with that topic, the homelessness as a topic, a vacancy issue. And I also mentioned the runaway cost of health insurance mm -hmm. and if there's anything that can be done at the state level. I, I don't know within the federal regulatory environment if we can, but it's certainly worth exploring because we can't sustain 20% increase um, in a now $800,000 uh, health insurance budget year after year. Um, okay. Sasha Anderson was in this afternoon uh, with a reminder about the Exchange Street intersection. Generally when the um, legislators are in, the board puts in a good word um, to try to move that up on the priority list. You're talking about the, the roundabout down there, that, that's first on my mind. Um, and to, uh, to make sure that that's at least that they're at least advocating to get that into a into a future plan because right now I think it's sitting in the limbo and last time the legislators were here you also spoke to them about route 125 improvements and mm -hmm. Holmes Jacobs sent you an email recently about that those and the status of those as well so are all the legislators confirmed that they're here next week or last time we missed Robin Shai, I think. Right, Robin has confirmed. Okay, so I hope they all come. Mm -hmm. So the other transportation project is Route 7 in, through the school corridor and that there's been a lot of discussion of that particular corridor that's come up in the Planapalooza sessions that I've attended and certainly in other committees. That's a full agenda dis to discuss already. Is there, is there anything else? Yeah, I, I, I think that's probably a good place to leave it uh, mm -hmm. because we have a couple of big topics and I mm -hmm. and maybe sort of agree on the sequence. I think that this issue of the transient population and the impact that it's having on our law enforcement is number one. Um, the others, I'm open as to what the sequence is because we may not get through all of them, but if we get a couple of good solid things in there, and then given the other things that we have to do, we'll trust your judgment um, as the chair as to how to allocate time and when is the appropriate time to say, okay, we've, we've gone through three really important things and maybe that's all we can do tonight, but. I, I would like to hear briefly what they see as their top priorities mm -hmm. also. Yes. So. Well, they, they just convened a very informing climate caucus and that was covered in Monday's Addison Independent and I got a chance to attend that. So I'm sure they'll speak to a lot of that. And solar permitting did come up in that conversation. The reason we're seeing either large scale or just rooftop solars because that's the way the permitting is favored right now. So you don't have those um, mid-sized arrays anymore really right now. And, and net metering is limited. Um, so they are looking at that and that is important and relevant to the project we were talking about tonight. 
Okay. So just a quick schedule yep. question. Um, are we, is this meeting next week in place of the one the following week? Are we? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Because that's I just Thanksgiving made, week. We've yeah. Moved I just it. have never made the change in my calendar. I wanted to make sure before I changed it that I was. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so with that, I'm going to move on to Laura. Uh, check warrants? Just a sec. <laughs> okay. Um, lots of salt. <laughs> It's that time, <laughs> 45,000 in the budget. <laughs> um, check warrants. So um, I, I have reviewed the check warrants. I move that we approve the total expenditures in the amount of $579,608, um, consisting of $477,077.99. dollars for accounts payable and the rest for payroll. Um, for the period of October 30th through November 12th, 2019. Okay. Moved and seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. Kathleen, town manager's report. The college is proposing Friday, December 13th as the date for the next town college lunch. Uh, for planning purposes, a summary of select board member attendance from 2014 to the present is included in your packet for discussion. Uh, if you want to think about what the agenda is going to be, typically that's what drives um, the attendance of the third member uh, for the December 13th meeting. That's solar array, right? We haven't started the agenda for that meeting yet, have we? Do you want to think about it and talk about it more next like meeting? To, uh, maybe, maybe you and, and uh, maybe we could could start the, the agenda with the college and and have it for the next week, or at least a beginning agenda, so that we can talk about who should attend. And then uh, just today, the. Schedule for the November 8th Addison County Capitol for a day. Um, Agency of Administration events uh, is in your packet, and it's also in the select board packet, which is online uh, for anyone that wants to attend. Uh, one thing that is happening in Middlebury is from 1 to 2 p.m. is the 2019 Agricultural Literacy Week, celebrating our culinary traditions. Commissioner of Libraries uh, Jason Broughton will be participating in a discussion and food tasting by, led by cookbook author Andrea Chesman as part of the 2019 Agricultural Literacy Week sponsored by the Department of Libraries, Agency of Food and Markets, and the Northeast Organic Farming Association. I had several of her cookbooks. Are they good? And that is it for the town manager's report. Yeah. Cool. Okay, thank the you. The governor will be in one, some of these meetings, or? Yes. Okay, uh, board member concerns. Laura. I, I appreciate the quick response to the storms we've had. Um, they were pretty severe. Uh, the Halloween rain and now this you know um, so I appreciate the effort of our staff to get sidewalks <laughs> open and shoulders cleared uh, as quickly as they can and and I did walk um, to work and back and to the meeting you know so I really appreciated the sidewalks being open and I know it's hard to keep them totally ice free I just want to remind viewers that they can help us by clearing also um, and using the buckets um, that are at intersections to spread sand salt as needed when they notice that it's needed. It's, we're in that kind of funny season where things will melt and freeze and, and that's what we saw today and we'll see over the next couple of days. So um, I hope people are, are just aware that there are 18 miles of sidewalks that have to be cleared. That's a lot, you know, to manage in a short period of time. So we're doing our best to get to that, and I appreciate that. 
Um, I also wanted to mention that it's the start of the parking ban, which winter parking ban, which we have on our website as a reminder. So, you know, just remember that we do have the actor bus, you know, as another alternative for shuttling about, especially in poor weather conditions like today. And that this is also the start of our burn period. Um, and I know that there was some confusion last year about the close of that, and I just want to remind viewers that that closes on April 30th, and there is a process for getting permits to burn, and it's at the website, so you can go to for, re for residents, and then click under ordinances, and you'll see the ordinances for burn permit and how to do that. Basically, you have to go to um, the Middlebury Police Station and get, get a request approved to do that, so I just thought I'd mention that tonight, too. Okay, thank you, Laura. <coughs> Nick. Well, I, uh, I did, we had that plan of Palooza this past weekend. I didn't make the first three days because I was up working in the 49th, but uh, I did get there yesterday and had some great conversations, but importantly heard some really good um, feedback from the planning team. Um, had some really good contributions. Uh, there's been a lot of good interaction. And so this document, everything I can see is moving forward better than I even imagined. And so thank you to everybody who's participated. Hopefully everybody had a chance to at least see something and it's some really good stuff coming along and participate in the future opportunities when they, they emerge. Good work. And uh, they're scheduled to speak with us on Friday, right? Friday. At the time Correct, the that's right, it was rescheduled. Victor. Hi there. Hi there. Okay. Ron? Or me, okay. Um, kudos to the PD for that story uh, Kathleen sent us about saving that baby. Uh, that was remarkable. Uh, thanks, Middlebury PD. And uh, welcome back, Brian. We missed you for two weeks, and I hope this puts a stop to all the trials and tribulations you've been going through. <laughs> oh, Thank you. Everybody's healthy. I was just going to say I was downtown when they blasted the other day. <laughs> It was very cool. <laughs> <laughs> what shocked you? I don't know if you want to say that in public. <laughs> it, it was actually a very cool experience, but what I was going to say was, and, and I know it's been said before, I'm continually impressed with Kubricki. They, you know, you, I could tell something was happening because so many people were like at their post, but they were all very professional. Um, you know, I, I I don't know, and I, I had gone in, you know, and also as an aside, I had gone in um, Sabai Sabai, and I had gone in the kitchen store while I was down there, and there were, it was pretty well populated in both, both places. I was going to say, if anybody listening has small children and they want to see some big equipment, go get lunch at Sabai Sabai, because it was like an amazing show, <laughs> you know, and it's right outside. You never get to be that close to that kind of equipment normally. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I was totally impressed, and then to see how quickly they cleaned up that mess and got everything open again. Like that was pretty impressive. They were digging up everything and then yeah. and then pretty pretty quick turnaround. So mm -hmm. it bodes well for next summer, I think. <coughs> thank you, Lindsay. So uh, just briefly thank everybody for the, the nice card. Uh, appreciate you uh, pulling for our girl. Uh, you know, our daughter's uh, there are ways to go, but uh, we're, we're very hopeful and thank you. Uh, I was, you know, when we had to go over to, to England, I was not expecting it, but it was an educational trip and I was amazed at uh, how disruptive some of the construction is in some of their townships. And they're going through a lot of the same stuff that we are with infrastructure and whatnot. It's old, you know, a lot of old infrastructure and uh, so, so I had an opportunity to observe some of how they're dealing with it, and I, I feel pretty good about the way we're doing it. So uh, it's, uh, you know, it is disruptive, but it could be a lot worse after I've seen it. So uh, thank you for all your efforts and uh, appreciate your thoughts, and please keep my baby girl in your prayers. Thanks. So uh, entertain a motion for uh, adjournment and... Uh, so moved. Second. We've been seconded. It's uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. Adjourn at 912.